Quincy, it's so awesome to have you. And and just on a on a personal note for uh, for folks who may not know, I've been writing on Free Code Camp for I think over a year now, and, and Quincy was uh, gracious enough to to help support the Julie ecosystem by um, letting me publish some articles there, which have uh, had a huge impact in reach, and um, it's been awesome to see sort of that. that um, your your community that you've built uh, be able to to learn about Julie and, and some of the things that that our community are doing. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's been just an honor having you share your expertise with the community. And thank you to Conrad too for that very kind introduction. Um, I'm thrilled to join here over at Pi Data. Uh, a, a lot of my friends are like, "Oh, you're going to be a Pi Data? That's awesome!" So uh, you know, the reputation precedes. The big event, and I, I'm thrilled. Uh, I'm thrilled to be here. So, thank you to both of you gentlemen, and, and thank you to everybody who's involved in organizing the event. Yeah, no, we we appreciate you being here, and it's uh, it's definitely a lot of work, but these are a ton of fun. So, uh, we're we're happy to put them on. Yeah, well, kind of. I right. will answer as many questions <laughs> as I can. Uh, sure. Yeah, and I just want to like be very candid and say that like I started free code camp eight years ago but i am one of many many people that makes all of this possible uh there are like more than a thousand prolific contributors from the past year for example I, like we just compiled the 2022 top contributors and a whole lot of open source contributors a whole lot of uh people uh of course writing tutorials about julia and, and other topics um, and then, of course, uh, we have a whole lot of people that are helping translate those tutorials into a variety of world languages, Japanese, Spanish, uh, Swahili, Ukrainian. Uh, and then, of course, we also have a whole lot of people that are just being extremely helpful in the community, hanging out on the forum, answering other people's questions. And, and then, of course, like the open source projects themselves, devdocs.io, freecodecamp.org, developerquiz.org. Uh, code radio, all the different kind of satellite things that we're doing. So uh, I just want to take a moment to thank those people and recognize them. And I don't want anybody to think like I'm just like <laughs> getting everything done myself because I'm just a very small piece in the puzzle. Yeah. And, and Quincy, maybe can you take us back to eight years ago when you first created Free Code Camp and, and sort of looking and reflecting back on what you've been able to achieve in those last eight years? And um, like, was the ambition this from the get-go like you wanted this massive global community where you have things translated into lang into multiple languages and billions of people reading this content or is it uh, a much smaller vision and it's just sort of um yeah taken off yeah. in the way that it does yeah i mean like i, I would you know like th this has greatly exceeded even my most ambitious crazy idea of what could be accomplished like i just published the number yesterday and uh people spent the equivalent of 8,000 years using free code camp in 2022. The, like the equivalent of like having 8,000 people at any given point using free code camp. And all I wanted to do was just make it a little easier for people to learn to code. So it wasn't so ambiguous and so lonely. Uh, so yeah, of course I'm like over the moon at <laughs> what we've accomplished. And I, I have to pinch myself every day um, because it feels like, you know, this is all a dream. We're just going to wake up and, you know, uh, have to start from scratch again. <laughs> As anybody who's created a project knows, like the, the biggest challenge in the world is getting people to even care about your project. And so a lot of the early projects I built were all they were all focused on technology education. I've always been interested in that area. Um, and I, before technology education, I worked as a school director and as a teacher teaching English mostly to students who were coming to the U.S., to get master's degrees and needed to be able to pass the TOEFL or some of these other standardized tests. Um, and so I've always been very interested in specifically adult education. And uh, I, I think that there are a lot of people doing very exciting, great work in helping kids, but the adults kind of like get left aside. In many cases, people just say, oh, well, you can just go work as a janitor. <laughs> you can go work as, uh, you know, like work at, Taco Bell, where I worked for a few years. And and like, so I know what kind of like desperate, like unfulfilling work it can be to work in, in retail or work, um, you know, like stocking shelves overnight at a grocery store, or I even work construction for a while. 
like uh, not like like those those can be great jobs and, and there can be a career progression. But a lot of jobs, you know, it, it's just kind of like the moment that your employer can automate away your job, they will without any sort of hesitation. Right. Um, so I wanted to make it a little easier for people to be able to get into what I can what I call like the the creative like knowledge worker type roles that increasingly require computer skills um, and knowledge of math, computer science, and programming specifically. So um, I wanted to make it a little easier for people to do that. So after creating a bunch of projects that nobody cared about, nobody used, uh, trying to get them on uh, Product Hunt or trying to like, you know, show them on Reddit to people like, hey, check out this thing I built. You know, like, like dealing with that indifference that pretty much everybody feels when they're trying to get a project out there and get, get some initial level of interest. Um, I just kind of sat down one weekend and I was like, let's strip out all the complexity. Let's make it as simple as possible. Let's come up with a very explicit name. <laughs> Free code camp. It's like totally unambiguous, right? And uh, pretty much in, regardless of what language people speak, if they went to high school and they have high school level English, they're probably going to be able to understand what free code camp means, right? They're probably going to be able to spell it. So um, yeah, like I just stood it up with the most simple curriculum, just a single linear curriculum. <laughs> and to this day, it's really just a single linear curriculum and a whole lot of supplemental resources. But uh, I'm sorry if I'm like giving like, the most long winded answer. I want to make sure we get to everybody's questions. But basically it was just, the, the desire to help people not have to, because I was 31 when I really started programming and I was just working as a school director and I needed to automate a lot of the things I was doing day to day. And that's where I got interested in Python and, uh, you know, using Excel spreadsheets, like trying to automate things using that, uh, automating things with this Windows tool called Auto Hotkey, where I could like program it to click on all the government forms for me. So I could like just kind of like, Alt tab over, <laughs> grab the data, alt tab back, fill in the form, and it would do that. And I, I could get up from my desk and go help students instead of sitting there, like, you know, clicking on things and web forms and stuff. And so that was the origins of my programmer skills. And then I was able to just like hang out at the hacker space and go to a lot of hackathons around California and, and build up my, my programming chops that way. Uh, and then I got a job as a software engineer about nine months after uh, learning, to co after leaving my job and just learning to code full time. Uh, just like sitting around the house, like going through library books, going through uh, free online courses, like uh, Stanford has some really good database courses, algorithms courses. Um, I managed to get the job and that was when the real learning started. So our goal has always been to like help people get that first job and then support them after they've gotten that first job as they continue to progress with their skills. And I have this very, like, some people may say it's overly, simplistic but this perception of like a, a typical career progression might be like you just get a job as like some sort of web development or doing something like that and you get your programming chops while you're going back and you're relearning all your stats and other mathematics and then you can continue to progress into like data science machine learning type roles and uh, or if you want you can get into like security devops like there, there are all these different progressions but i really do believe that like web development is kind of like the shortest path to getting paid <laughs> and actually having some responsibility on a team. So free code camps curriculum, if you look at it, it's extremely linear. It's like, let's learn some HTML, <laughs> let's learn some CSS, let's learn some uh, Linux command line, let's learn how SQL works, you know, and, and like, let's go through this very clear progression to ramp you up toward a job. It's, it's kind of like the shortest path to a job. So to this day, that's, that's still in the curriculum, you'll see it's extremely pragmatic. And uh, we try, we, the, it's not like descend it from the ivory tower. It's very much like bottom up from talking to hiring managers and just trying to understand what work needs to be done so people can go out and do that. Yeah, Quincy, it sounds like you gave yourself the original, um, like you made your own boot camp to begin with, basically, when you started full time those those nine months, which is super cool. And, and um, also sounds like you sort of maybe blazed that trail um, inadvertently for a lot of people who now it's it's sort of a more traditional path when people go in boot camp um, instead of going and like doing a four year computer science degree, which is also something that Free Code Camp is sort of working on. So we'll talk about that later. But I wanted to ask one one other follow up question, and then I'll, I'll pass it to Conrad. Um, that initial curriculum that you developed, 
um, the the sort of simple MVP version. Uh, like, did that did that originally initially get traction, or did you have to sort of build off of that, or, or what was the sort of state when you put it out into the world, and then were, were people showing up, or or no? What was yeah. the situation? That's a great question. And all my other projects had been crickets when you put it up, but free code camp was different. Like within, like I built it like the MVP within a weekend and stood it up and started tweeting about it. And by the end of the weekend, people were like in the chat room hanging out and a day or two later, it was on the front of hacker news. And like, it, so there was that critical mass, like it, it, you know, you never know when you're building projects, your next project might be the big breakthrough or, or even the current project. There might just be like, some minor tweak that you make that that you know makes all the difference. For us, it was having that simple linear curriculum and having it be very you know free. <laughs> Obviously, free is the most powerful word in marketing. It's the most powerful. Like people just don't want to whip out their credit cards, even if it's like a dollar, right? Like people really like being able to just use things freely, and and any suspicion of the organization kind of like dissipates if if the if it's completely free. And, we were very transparent about like user data and stuff like that. <laughs> to this day, the only personal identifying information we collect from people is their email address, um, just so we can authenticate them and, and track their progress, right? And then if they want, they can add other, you know, information and populate their profile. But uh, but yeah, we we wanted to basically just make it extremely approachable. And that curriculum, like for whatever reason, uh, maybe it was because I struggled through all this stuff myself and I knew what courses were good, like Stanford's CS course was really good. Um, and there were some other, uh, you know, MOOCs, they used to call them MOOCs. I don't know if anybody knows what a MOOC is. Mo massive online open course. Um, massively open. Yeah. Anyway, MOOC. Uh, there were like a whole bunch of those and I basically strapped those together. And they were like, I think it was like 14 MOOCs or something constituted the original curriculum and people would just self-report like I finished this. And then we started rolling out the interactive like validation where you could get kind of a flow state where you're like, all right, I'm developed, I'm like coding in the browser. This passes. I know that I've done the correct thing. I advance to the next one. And and that was really like that interactivity has really been our hallmark ever since. It's just actually having evaluation criteria and not relying on the person to manually verify like themselves. Like it looks like I got this right. Okay, I'm gonna mark it done and move on. Like it just removes a lot of the ambiguity. But yes, sorry for the very long answer, but but yeah, like the, the curriculum itself just took off uh, pretty pretty much immediately. Oh, huh. thank you. Uh, and so uh, I guess uh, uh, just, just uh, so a quick thought, like I really like uh, how you talked about uh, how you're uh, doing more uh, adult education stuff and making sure that that part is, is covered. I really do believe that tech is the great equalizer uh, especially coming from uh, myself, uh, having not started out uh, as, as you know immediately as a programmer, um, but so uh, so you also talked about you know for example like uh, for this uh, for free code camp, uh, you knew it was immediately different. Yeah. It was immediately uh, uh, a, 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 a different from the other projects that you've done because you know like a day or two later it was on Hacker News uh, and stuff like that. I was wondering uh, you know. Uh, could you, like like were there any like really memorable or like notable milestones and achievements uh, uh, of free code camp that you could talk about and also maybe more quantitatively do you guys have any uh, you know specific metrics uh, or, or, or KPIs that you now use to uh, track free code camp and inform any decisions that you guys make as a, as, as, a, as a group I guess now right? Yeah, that's an excellent question. I apologize if I didn't hear 100% of it because my son wanted me to like be the level on Mario Odyssey for him. He often walks in with the Switch like, oh, daddy. Um, but uh, what I was going to uh, to answer your question to the best of my ability, uh, it, maybe I can restate your question. Uh, anything that was like a big breakthrough for us quantitatively that, that could be quantified. Um, the, I think the biggest breakthrough for us early on was that people started getting jobs and uh, we set up like a LinkedIn alumni network <laughs> And people could add their certifications when they claim them. And then that made it relatively easy for us to go in just within LinkedIn's UI and see, okay, like these people, like it shows where are people working at. And if you go to Free Code Camp's LinkedIn Alumni Association, you'll see a lot of people are working on like um, working at Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, like all, all the big tech companies, Alibaba, Tencent, and then, uh, you know, uh, even, even some uh, African tech companies, uh, and 
then a lot of people have like Odesk or not Odesk anymore. It's like free, not freelancer.com. There's like the, the newer, um, they, they like all merged and created like this, this new website. But a lot of people uh, do work on that, like as contractors. And, and, um, and then you see just a lot of people that have created their own consultancies. But seeing people actually getting jobs, especially, you know, as, you know, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people, um, now, currently, like the Alumni Association, which has more than a million followers, but there, it, officially it has like 200 some thousand alumni who have earned a certification and at least one certification. Um, just seeing like where they work and what they're doing and all that stuff, is, it's really inspiring. Um, and so once we saw that, that was when we knew, okay, it's working. Like it's not like some hypothetical, it's not like a bunch of people like wishfully thinking like, uh, oh, if I make it through this, maybe I'll be able to get a job. Like it became a proven path to getting a job. And at that moment, that's when we really started to get like serious, like like I had a lot of engineering managers and people like that. Like, oh yeah, like people started taking free code camp seriously because they started seeing people who went through free code camp being able to get through, you know, the Google job interview battery, things like that, right? Um, so that is one metric that we think is really important is just like the proportion of people and the total amount of people that uh, get jobs, but some other data that we use um, for each of the challenges on the free cooking curriculum, we track how long it takes somebody to complete it. So we have like average completion time and, and we use that metric to like identify potential bottlenecks in the curriculum where like this isn't sufficiently well explained because people should be able to complete this challenge in like two minutes or less, right? And they're taking an average of four minutes. What's going on with this? Can we reword this? Can we break this down into smaller bits? So we use data that way. Um, and and that's like another big thing. It, but I just published an article like less than 24 hours ago about our 2022 usage statistics. And, and it kind of breaks down like the usage of all these different, uh, we have the four pillars of FreeCodeCamp, which it wasn't your question, but I can tell you real quick. It's the forum where people help one another. It's the publication where uh, Logan and the other uh, developers publish uh, tutorials uh, and, and just kind of like, hey, I built this project. Here's how you can build it, like code along at home type things. And then we have the uh, community YouTube channel where we'll publish full length courses. Um, and then we have, of course, the main core curriculum. Uh, so those four pillars. And I kind of break down the usage growth of those over the past few years as well. Um, and everything us for us is just learner minutes. That's like the metric we care about. We don't really care about like retention, like how many people actually complete the entire program because nobody completes the entire program. It's too long. Like you could easily go out and get a job once you're like even a third of the way through the curriculum. The idea is that you can keep going back to the curriculum and keep expanding your skills over a longer period of time. And, uh, and obviously nobody can complete all the extracurricular uh, courses because we publish like, I don't know, 10, 15, 20, some, some weeks we might publish like 50 hours worth of coursework. No, nobody's going to be able to go through like our, our MATLAB course and then shift gears and do our flutter course. And like, like they're just supplemental resource. So we just focus on the absolute amount of time that people are learning. And that's our kind of like uh, way of like genericizing usage. Um, so we can just understand like use connotes usefulness. <laughs> so that's how we kind of like, like, okay, people are using it. That's good. I don't know, like that may sound unsophisticated or overly reductive, but uh, that's how we've been doing it. And I'm, I'm well, I welcome any feedback or thoughts that you all have about how we, what might be interesting, what insights might be interesting. I think uh, that's a, it's, 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 a, it's a very good point. I think, uh, you know, uh, just uh, the workshops and learning is only the first step. Right. So, so the next step is actually, you know, getting the job, learning on the job and like career progression afterwards. Right. So that's definitely the most important uh, metric to track. Uh, just very quickly, uh, we, we have a lot of questions. Um, uh, so, so I'm just going to ask a very quick follow-up question, but yeah. it is, uh, you know, I didn't want this to be all data points. So I wanted to also ask you, you know, what was your most memorable, uh, you know, when did you decide, oh my God, free code camp, you know, like, like we made it, right. It, it's yeah. a thing that. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, there, there's not any one moment that, that comes to mind. I just had, like, I mean, like, 
this, this is kind of weird and surreal, but like if I just open my inbox, uh, there'll be people like, Hey, I got this job here. Or like, it, it's just like constantly people talking, people, people who have, people who are completely blind, for example, who have like substantial disabilities that they're living with and they're still able to go out and use their skills to get jobs and things like that. That was, that was like a big uh, moment for me is hearing about those kinds of stories. Yeah, that's so cool. And it, it, it almost sounds like the the success has been there. I'm sure there's been bumps along the road, but like from the very get go, like as soon as as soon as it was on the front page of Hacker News when you first announced it, and I'd imagine it's, um, yeah, it's been sort of a, a steady rocket ship for the last for the last eight years, which is super cool to see. But wanted to to drop over to one of the audience questions, um, which I think is is, is super relevant. Um, Francesco is asking, how do you deal with the fact that there are so many resources right now um, that can be super overwhelming for, for beginners um, who, are, who are trying to learn how to program? Yeah, I mean, that's an excellent question. And that's actually one of the, the reasons that FreeCodeCamp exists is because we wanted to have a single linear curriculum that represents, like I said, like kind of like a, a, a clear shortest path to that first developer job. Uh, and if you look at the FreeCodeCamp curriculum, we don't have any electives. We don't have any branching you know, logic or anything like, like, Oh, if you've already done this, skip this and go to here. Like it is just like start here and you can skip anything you want and keep moving downward, but, but you shouldn't be like jumping up and down and stuff like that. Right. Like, um, like every single part of the free cocaine curriculum, you can skip it. If you build the projects that are required to earn that certification, you can, you can get that certification regardless of whether you did any of the actual instructional content it's just a quick evaluation criteria. So that makes it easier for people that are intermediates to come in there and just quickly progress to where they, you know, to the Goldilocks zone where it's, it's, um, it's hard enough for them and, and they're actually learning new stuff instead of just reviewing. Uh, so, you know, we're as guilty as anybody of just inundating the world with free learning resources. Um, and uh, what we do is we do that with a caveat that like, hey, this is a good reference but if you need to learn the fundamentals, you should just use the core curriculum. Um, that would be my humble advice. Uh, and, and again, there's so many resources. There's so many different curricula, like, you know, Harvard CS50, for example. If you just go through that, you'll get a really good foundation in computer science concepts. Um, you know, but you don't necessarily need to do that first, or you can do that in tandem with using Free Code Camp. But Free Code Camp represents it. If at any point you're like, this is too complicated, just, you know, go to Free Code Camp. We will make it as simple as we can. I love that. And and maybe one more, this goes back to something you were talking about before, as far as some of the pillars of free code camp, but something that was, has always been very interesting to me. Um, and obviously it works in some sense because the free code camp YouTube is, is huge and has a massive reach and it gets a ton of engagement from, from your community and from people who want to learn how to program in general. But, um, I had always imagined that for like educational content, it made more sense to chunk things down into small little pieces, but free code camp actually releases like some of the courses that you put on YouTube are like 24 hour long YouTube videos, which I didn't even know was possible <laughs> sometimes until I saw you all doing it. So what's the thought behind having it be like one giant um, video instead of sort of breaking it up into smaller chunks or are people not supposed to be consuming it on youtube and it's like broken up on the website or something like that i mean uh first of all how do we get like such long videos on the youtube our longest one is I think 37 hour, we have a 37 hour flutter course um and we do it through compression tricks <laughs> um with compression you can get you can get like uh the 25 hour 4k I think that the Harvard course is uh, 4K. We've published some other courses that are 4K as well. Um, but uh, the reasoning behind just publishing the entire course is because, first of all, people can see what you see is what you get, right? It's not like, oh, okay, oh, look, this, like, oh, actually, you got to pay to get the rest of the course or um, like any of those kind of like shenanigans. Like you can see it's a 25-hour course right there in the timestamp and it simplifies things. Other thing is it's very easy to share. You just copy the, like the address bar and you throw that in your text message to your friend and be like, hey, check out this course, you know, um, and it's also very easy to bookmark, right? Um, so it's just the simplicity uh, and the accessibility of having everything in one video. And then you just use timestamps and you get like that broken up bar at the bottom and people who do want to skip around can skip around, but they're skipping around on the same video. So they don't have to worry. Uh, also, 
if somebody wants to download the video, we have a lot of people that will like go to like an internet cafe or something in parts of the world where data is more expensive. They'll get on some Wi-Fi, they can download the entire video, and then they can watch it that way over the course of the next week or two. Um, so it, it's 100% just for convenience and accessibility um, for learners. No, that makes a ton of sense. That would be something where the metrics would be really interesting to look at and see like, do you, do people like see a 24 hour long video and say, oh, that's, you know, it's a little too scary for me versus like, you know, a five minute video, maybe I'll dive in and, and get started because it seems uh, more approachable than, than some of those long uh, 24 hour videos. Yeah. And, and that's an important point is um, a lot of people do what's called information grazing. We're like, oh, I want to learn about this. And there's a, there's a very good chance, channel called Fireship. It just does like C++ in three minutes or whatever, right? And it's a cool video. I'm not criticizing them or anything, but you can't learn C++ in three minutes. Like nobody thinks you can learn that. They're, they're just, it's almost kind of comical that like, we're going to give you the most superficial possible, you know, overview. And then, you know, our C++ course might be like 12 hours or something like that. And it's just the basics, um, something like that, right? So um, I think that... Uh, we want people to realize that, okay, this is a serious course. Like this is, we're not oversell. Like the biggest problem I think on the internet with like people think that they can get away with like over promising and under delivering and that that'll be a viable strategy long-term, but it isn't all. What it does is it just breeds kind of like suspicion that everybody's just like trying to trick you into like, like, Oh, this isn't actually that comprehensive. Like you're, it's very easy as a learner to essentially learn the same fundamental stuff like over and over, right? Like you could spend 24 hours watching one hour beginner tutorials on the same exact topic and just relearn that same stuff. Or you can go really deep with a longer course. So part of the reason we have these really long courses is we're emphasizing, no, this is like really deep. Like we're giving the, the topic sufficient breadth uh, or like sufficient room uh, for you to really like learn something and to really code along at home and build a substantial project rather than just building like a quick hello world type proof of concept. Cool. Um, I, I was also just wondering, uh, just building on the uh, uh, comment from the uh, uh, audience, um, in terms of your like relationship with some of the other uh, resources and uh, platforms out there, like, like, or like, so personally, at least when when you know, when I've been uh, you know chatting with friends and talking to them about like hey here's how you can learn uh, data science right like I try to heavily um, utilize all the available resources out there right so like you know we we might have our own thing but we might also just say like hey but like if you don't know this thing this other like free like uh, open source resource there there is like super good. Right. Uh, so, so to, I like, I don't want to re like reinvent the wheel. Right. Like, uh, uh, like, like, why don't you take a look at that? Right. Uh, is this something that you guys do at all or. Yeah. Yeah. So um, what we do, we're, we're probably going to create our own course on practically every topic eventually, especially if we can get like, like the TensorFlow team has, has been giving us grants to develop courses um, for example. So we're going to cover like a lot of those ML, like I know a lot of uh, creators, like, uh, Tina Huang, Kenji, like people on um, that are on like kind of developer YouTube essentially. Um, and they're individual creators and they're creating really uh, cool. They'll, they'll create uh, shorter videos and then maybe they'll have a course on like Udemy or something like that. Like we can't reproduce a lot of what they're doing in terms of the specific angle. Like a lot of what makes YouTube great is the individual instructor um, and like their particular approach toward explaining something or their particular project ideas that they, they incorporate and things like that. So uh, I want to make it clear that even though we're hitting a lot of these topics, I want to like, like there is no one-stop shop really for anything. Uh, certainly not for like learning resources. And I do encourage people to like try everything out there. Uh, I, what I can say is like, we don't have control over the quality of other people's um, courses, but we do have direct control over the quality of FreeCodeCamp's courses. So at some point, like if, if you want it done right, it makes sense to just do it yourself. So that, that's kind of our philosophy is like, we want to like, encourage people to use these uh, resources and we all talk like, like 
uh, I, I talk with all these creators and they, they probably talk to one another as well. Uh, and, and we're all just trying to basically like education. YouTube is this very, very tiny slice of YouTube as a whole, especially technology education, YouTube. And because it's, it's growing so quickly, like I often tell people when the pie is growing really fast, it makes sense to, to focus on like, like it doesn't make sense to fight for like tiny, like additional like degrees on the pie. Um, you know, just, just focus on trying to get pie. <laughs> Um, so, so it's, it's very collaborative and fun and there's a lot of crossovers, things like that, um, on YouTube. So that would be the main thing I, I, I'd emphasize is like, nobody's saying like, just use free code camp. Like even we're not saying that, like we're saying there's no one stop shop and you should make use of all the different resources out there. Um, yes. Uh, and I, I think, uh, definitely, uh, the, the tech field moves so fast, right? So, so you know, just every, like it, like everyone is scrambling to just uh, like each uh, every every single uh, piece of uh, like a workshop or a piece of material is definitely scrambling even just to uh, be uh, stay current and relevant. And there there's a lot of maintenance and update needed. Uh, so maybe it's time to talk about uh, you know um, plans for the future. You know, like like where do you see uh, uh, free code camp going like how do you make sure that uh, things uh, uh, things stay relevant um, yeah, back to yeah. You. well um, free code camps open source and uh, one of the things we do with interactive curricula is it's very easy to just go in and update uh, a code snippet to like adopt like a best practice or um, update some tests to to address like a, a common alternate way of like coding something um, so what because there, there's this maxim in open source uh, with enough eyeballs, all bugs are shallow. They'll get fixed eventually by some well-meaning uh, open source contributor. So a lot of the curriculum is just, I liken it to like, I took some extremely jagged, you know, rocks that I found on the ground and put them into this rock tumbler that is the open source community. And over the years, the curriculum is like, kind of like become polished stones. Um, and, the same thing goes for whenever we introduce new curricula, for example, the new relational database certification or um, some of the upcoming uh, data science courses that we're developing. Uh, but a lot of it is just a desire and a willingness to be corrected by the community and to have things be improved. Uh, and it's not just us doing it. Again, we've got hundreds of open source contributors in the past year that have gone in and made a PR on GitHub and so I, I think a big part of it is just, you know, opening yourself up to criticism and critique and, and having people come in and say like, oh, this is like a deprecated method or, or like, oh, this, this entire approach. Like, uh, I think it was like the, the creator of Redux was uh, the enabler off. He was like, don't use the Redux anymore. Well, our curriculum still technically uses Redux. We're working on like taking it out with the new version, but like, uh, that's something that we're actively trying to do is adapt or, or adopt uh, new emerging best practices and adapt as, you know, the tools change over time, the tools and the, the general preferences. Cause a lot of it is not necessarily like a lot of it is kind of circular. Like there will be conventions that, you know, Oh, we're going to use this certain approach that's in vogue from 1970s instead of this 1990s approach that is no longer in vogue, but, that 1990s approach may ultimately be back in vogue later. But a lot of it is just convention. It doesn't really matter what's right so much as like what is likely to be understood by your colleagues and what is likely to be seen as a sensible solution if you're in a whiteboard coding interview, right? Um, so a lot of it is just us like adapting to the ever-changing meta. Yeah, and, and going back to the, the second part of Conrad's question around the future for Free Code Camp, I know I saw the announcement, um, it had to have been a few months ago now, around creating like a university degree program. I'm not sure if I fully grasp what what that all entails. So it, it seems really cool. And it seems like it's this uh, dream situation where people can get an education without having to pay through all the ivory tower stuff that we we know that traditional education has. Um, so can you can you dive into the details about like what that what it actually means in practice for people? Yeah, absolutely. So I've always been a big fan of universities, even though I think they're overpriced for the most part. 
you know, I liked the university so much. I went to back to grad school and uh, I feel like everybody should be able to get a university degree. And I feel like ideally should be completely socioeconomically blind in the sense that anyone who wants to invest the time and energy in completing the coursework should be able to get the degree. Uh, and I don't like the notion of like fees and enrollment and application and like, oh, your, your enrollment is no longer current. You have to <laughs> reapply or, oh, we can't accept these transfer credits, like all this stuff, right? Like, uh, so what, what I set out to do, like, I mean, in my mind, I've always wanted, felt university should be free, but I knew if I came out in 2011, when I was just some guy that was learning to code, like nobody would, it wouldn't have any credibility if I said, we're going to create a free university degree. Nobody would take it seriously because it is a multi-decade endeavor, essentially. Like, uh, it's going to take us probably like six or seven years just to develop the coursework for the university degree program. But we are developing uh, 40 uh, full-length university courses that they constitute, you know, 90 plus hours of coursework. Most of that being labs, lectures, and then a final exam uh, for each of the 40 courses. So um, what we're doing is if you pull up that particular announcement it lists out the specific courses and so it starts with a associates an associate of science in mathematics and in that you basically recap all of high school math and then you go into you know stats calc um you know uh, all the different like linear algebra stuff that's really useful in programming and uh machine learning um and so you're going to complete those along with general ed courses like epistemology, we call it philosophy of knowledge and, uh, you know, like ethical thought, things like that. So, so it's very much like a similar to how education traditionally was before the 1900s where everybody studied the exact same, you know, trivium and quadrivium and got a liberal arts degree. Um, and then they got out, everybody had the same basic skill set, right? Math, um, science and understanding like the arts and things like that, right? Um, understanding rhetoric, understanding uh, logic and reasoning, um, things like that. So we, we, we definitely tip our hat very heavily to that educational tradition that's a thousand years old. Um, there are no electives. So everybody just goes through the exact same 20 courses. After completing those, they get an associate of science in mathematics. Then we have another 20 courses that basically just stacks right on top of it that, that focuses more on uh, computer science, software engineering, and ultimately machine learning. Uh, there, there are going to be several machine learning focused courses. And there are security focused courses, um, which, so what we did was we did a, a cross analysis of the top 20 computer science programs in the United States Carnegie Mellon, Harvey Mudd, Stanford, MIT. Um, you know, all these schools, Caltech, and we looked at what they were teaching and we basically just drew a best fit line <laughs> through them. <laughs> and we're like, okay, we're going to teach the most conventional degree imaginable, but it's going to be free. The key differentiator is it's completely free. It's completely self-paced. And there are some uh, tuition free degree programs you can get like uh, University of the People's doing good work. Uh, Western Governors University is doing good work, but there's still some financial costs associated with it. You're still going to spend like ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars earning one of those degrees potentially, depending on how long it takes. With free co camp, the idea is it could take you 10 years to complete it, but you're never going to spend a dime. Once you've completed a certain amount, you'll formally matriculate and you'll earn your degree. <laughs> um, and that's that. Right. And then so once we've finished all the coursework, gotten the students enrolled, started gathering outcome data and all this, then we can go through the process of accreditation which is a long process. It's an expensive process, but basically it involves having a lot of PhDs from other universities come and like look at your coursework and essentially audit it to see whether they think it's good and look at your outcomes data. Um, so our, our goal is eventually have this, these degrees have the same type of accreditation that other universities have. Um, but again, be completely free. That's, that's the, everything's about the free. That's the, the core differentiator here. Yeah, and, and Quincy, can you elaborate on maybe from your 
background in the education space like why can you not just take like for example you have the the you know cs50 classroom david um you know he he's accredited he teaches at harvard that's an accredited program why can we not just take these classes that already exist out there and i know obviously it would be awesome if you know to have them remade and, and more accessible in some way but why can't they just be repackaged um if a university approves that and then like automatically accredited yeah. like the same the, the cs50 online um is the same cs50 if you were sitting in the classroom listening to david live right um the main challenge first of all is there could be like some dependencies like some circular dependencies like this course assumes you know algebra like really well <laughs> and oh you haven't taken an algebra course so like okay go grab an algebra textbook figure it out like when you get courses from different universities like even if you go to like like the university i went to which was uh oklahoma the uh, university of central oklahoma right it's like this small state school cost me like a thousand bucks a year to go back in 2000 um and uh yeah like it, it was a thousand bucks a semester it wasn't a thousand bucks. so three thousand because i always did the summer semesters um it was really cheap though like i'm not complaining <laughs> but uh but like that like even in between courses at that same university, I would find like the teaching style would be completely different. The teacher would presume I had taken other courses that weren't actually part of the formal curriculum. You go talk to the department chair, like it's kind of chaotic because every professor wants to put their fingerprints on their individual course and they get to choose their textbook. Sometimes it's a textbook that they happen to author. So they're getting like money from textbook sales as a result of having university students take their course. There's all these conflicting, like, like academia is kind of a, um, you know, it, it's not like a, an extremely easy to pin down place. I, it's got a thousand years of history. Universities have these extremely powerful professors that have tenure, that they kind of have a high degree of freedom and can basically just buck administrative uh, decisions. Administrators might make decisions that professors, you know, rightfully disagree with because they're putting like institutional profitability above pedagogy, things like that, right? So um, you can't just grab like omikase cell, like all these different things and like slap them together and ha you can, there's a, so it's called Open Source Society University. It was started by a free code camp alum, OSSU. And uh, it's basically like, hey, we figured out which courses you should take in one sequence that are available on Coursera and edX and all these other programs, right? That's cool. And then you just hang out in the Discord and ostensibly everybody goes through the course. I don't know if people actually complete all four years of that, but even if you did, you wouldn't have an institution that gives you the degree. And frankly, the degree is what gets the HR person to check the box when they're like using whatever software to like go through these degrees. And, and HR people, you know, at a company that might spend six seconds is, is the average from a few years ago I wrote about this. Uh, they'll spend an average of six seconds looking at a resume and if you don't have a college degree, it's quite possible they'll spend zero seconds looking at it because they'll just filter you out. For all the talk at you know big tech companies about not caring about university degrees, people that don't have university degrees are still greatly underrepresented, and that might change over time. But we're not we're not going to wait and see. We're going to do something about it and make it to where anybody can get a degree. So. Uh, that's kind of a little bit of a digression from your question, which is like, why can't you just take these MOOCs that are already really high quality? Are we going to find a teacher who's as skilled as David Malin to teach computer science? No. <laughs> like He's like the world renowned, like greatest computer science teacher in the world. Right. Like um, his course is the most popular MOOC of all time. It's the most popular course at Harvard. Right. Like we're, we're not going to be able to do it, but we are going to do a good job in a way that like interoperates with all the other math courses that preceded and everything. And we're going to cover similar topics. Um, we're all drawing from the same, you know, tradition of thousands of years of math and hundred, you know, decades of computer science. Right. You know, what's a uh, very interesting, I realized, uh, um, your your view on how to design the curriculum is uh, very opinionated, right? Like, you know, uh, currently, you know, a simple linear program, right. For the, the college stuff, you know, no electives, everybody does the same thing. And so it, it really reminds me of uh, the the set of Python, the Pythonic way, right? Like simple is better than complicated. There should only yeah. be one way. Like we're going to be very opinionated about how this should go. Um, 
But one thing I did notice actually is uh, for the code camp, you know, it's it's a one linear thing, but you expect people to maybe uh, 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 dr uh, like drop off or, or, you know, like choose, choose which parts they want to do. Uh, but for college, that would be slightly different, right? Because now like you are going to be mandating them to actually, you know, do the whole thing, right? They could just do the exams. So, uh, you know, the exam might only take an hour and you're like, okay, I already know algebra, so I'm just going to sit for the exam. You don't have to pay a fee to take the exam. You just take it as many times as you want. And if your hubris gets the best of you, you just go back, hit the books and then try again, right? So, so like, there's always, we always want to have a release valve for people who feel like they don't need it, whether that's true or not. Uh, you know, confidence is the problem. Feedback is the cure. Um, let people knock themselves out. Right. Uh, that, that's kind of been our philosophy, but we don't want to force anybody to sit through a bunch of videos uh, and and do a bunch of labs. We want them to be able to just if they can demonstrate mastery, just keep moving. Yeah, I wanted to jump to another question from the audience, which is it should be a nice, quick one. Um, but you mentioned something about a data science curriculum that's being worked on. And I'm not sure if this is related to this or not, or if you can comment on this or yeah, not. Yeah, absolutely. So so those courses that we're developing uh, on like, you know, uh, reinforcement learning and um, supervised, unsupervised transfer learning, like things like that, that is all going to be part of the degree program. So those are more lecture focused. They're going to have interactive labs, but they're going to be part of the degree program. So instead of trying to develop a completely separate computer science curriculum, what we we're doing is we're, we're introducing those as courses that you can complete. And uh, they're, they're going to be the same content. We're just also putting them in the context of the computer science degree. Now, you might be asking, but it's an undergraduate in computer science. Like, I strongly believe that every computer science undergrad should learn these skills in 2022. I mean, if, if you look like what's happening with, you know, GPT-3 and, and Dolly and like all the other tools, uh, stable diffusion, things like that, like, it's clear that that's going to be a big part of working in tech in the future. Just like every, like almost none of the university de degree programs we saw had an ethics course. Almost none of them had a security course. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that security wasn't taught like mandatory for every single undergrad to like learn information security, but it wasn't. So we're stepping in uh, with our very opinionated, uh, just as Conrad Ho said uh, a second ago, <laughs> We are trying to make sure that people get this, even if you know there's like a lagging you know, computer science curricula. Again, it takes a while to get a whole bunch of uh, academics to agree and launch a new course and get the department chair. So education is necessarily kind of slow and that keeps it from constantly jumping around and chasing trends and stuff. Uh, but at the same time, we, we have the ability to say like, we are gonna cover a whole lot of machine learning in this course or in this degree program. A, a quick fun fact about um, me and Conrad, when, when we were putting together interview questions, we actually used the new GPT chat um, and we haven't been, you know, asking directly what, uh, what it, cause we've been riffing and having an, an awesome conversation, but the starting point for a lot of the questions that we were putting together beforehand came from that. And they're all like extremely, extremely good and, and well thought out. So it's, it's crazy to see like, and, and that's today. And you can only imagine in three or four years, like what systems like that are going to be able to do. It's, it's incredible. Um, but I had, I had one more question and then I'll, I'll toss it back over to Conrad. Something that you mentioned before right away was that, um, you know, free, co free code camp isn't just you. It's this global community of people. It's now, I assume there's a bunch of full-time staff as well that, that work for you. Um, and I'm wondering how that, um, you know, a little bit selfishly for myself, how you've sort of continued to scale your impact as, um, you know, you have all these new initiatives coming out. Um, interested to know, and also maybe, uh, touching on a little bit around the experience for you transitioning from just being the person who could make all the decisions to now having to sort of, um, again, collaborate with people and, and work through that process. Yeah. So we have a team and uh, generally I just delegate like, um, for example, Ragesh makes a lot of our information security decisions and uh, Muhammad makes a lot of our code base decisions. Oliver, uh, Jessica, like, I, I, I really, I just defer to people who seem to be more passionate. The entire team, it, it's kind of like everybody just grabs the work 
that they're interested in doing, and then they really become familiar with that area of the code base or that area of, uh, you know, course creation and things like that. I'm heavily inspired by Valve, the, the video game company. Like, they, they kind of did this thing at the time, which was revolutionary, which is like, there's no managers. Like, everybody just works on what they're interested in. And if they want to get other people to work on something, they have to make a compelling argument. Like, oh, we should build this, and you should come and help. And if they get people to glom onto a project, then that project gets done. And then, like, the less exciting projects don't necessarily get done. Uh, but, you know, obviously security and things like that, those may not be as exciting, but they do need to get done, right? So to some extent, that, that breaks down and you have to say, like, I know you want to be building this, but we really need to, like, you know, do, do our, you know, uh, OPSEC audit or <laughs> something like that, right? Um, and, and then a lot of the, the quote, unquote, boring stuff, uh, like the accounting stuff, um, like processing payroll, like I've got like uh, I've got all these like free code camp shirts down there. You might be able to see that big box. Those those are um, I've got like this giant box full of free code camp shirts. And it, it, like there wasn't anybody clear to like delegate this to, but I wanted to make sure everybody on the team had at least like two or three shirts. So I I'm mainly taking these poly poly mailers and like slapping labels on them and shipping them around the world. <laughs> That's like one of the things that needed to be done, and it wasn't clear who to delegate that to. So uh, a part of that is just being like an extremely low budget, like charity. Um, we don't have like just tons of money to like delegate these things. Like, oh, we're going to get this shipping and fulfillment. Like that stuff costs money. And like my time, I can just listen to some music and bag stuff up. So a lot of those decisions are made just kind of preserving scarce donor funds. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know if that 100% answers your question, but a lot of it is just like, it's, it's not, we're not thinking on uh, like an extremely systematic, like, you know, you, how, how you would envision like Tim Cook making decisions about logistics and stuff like that. And like having these big meetings with all these managers and like them reporting to their reports or, or in the military, right? Like there's not like some big chain of command. It's just me working alongside these other developers and instructors around the world and like trying to help. Yeah, I love that. I think that resembles the open source community and um, yeah, in its entirety. Um, so uh, speaking of, uh, you know, uh, like a, a running sort of like a small non, not, I mean, small, but growing uh, nonprofit, you know, like you just showed us your, uh, uh, the t-shirts, right? Uh, I, I think like a really important part of this is how to uh, hook into the uh, you know growth hacking or like 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 hook into like an angle that can help you scale, right? So like um, I was just wondering you know do you have any uh, like especially for like other people who also really want to you know uh, build a large community to 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 do something impactful, right? Like do you have any uh, advice? Yeah, <laughs> I have tons of advice. Thank you for that's a great question. Thank you. Um, first of all, make use of big platforms, but don't become too invested in them. Obviously, you can see the chaos going on on Twitter. It does affect us. Like we've got, I don't know, like six hundred thousand or so followers for Free Coquint that we worked really hard over, you know, eight years to build up that following and to to only share like the most useful, helpful tweets because we don't want people to like have second thoughts. Why am I following this website? You know, um, I personally, you know, probably spent like waking months of my life. Uh, responding to learners on Twitter and like encouraging them and doing things like that, right? Um, and if the platform goes down tomorrow, it's going to be really sad. I don't think it'll go down, but it, the quality is most likely going to go down if they get rid of the moderation staff and stuff. Uh, and it, it just reminds me like, you know, you want to kind of surf these these waves, right? Like maybe this platform is cresting and you want to go on that and then you're going to want to jump off to another wave as this one declines. They're, like every company is ultimately going to get acquired by somebody else um, unless they're a nonprofit, in which they can't really be acquired except by another nonprofit. That's a fun fact. Um, so you don't have to worry about this happening to free co-camp, but you do have to worry about it happening to, I mean, with TikTok, it's already like part of a giant corporation. Uh, but um, for example, Instagram's a great example. Like a lot of people really felt like this cool grassroots community, like, oh yeah. And then it got bought by Facebook. Right. And you could argue that it hasn't gone down hell too much. Uh, but the, the point is like, there, there's always going to be like this window of time where you can strike while that iron is hot. And at some point you're going to get diminishing returns from that and you should move on. Don't 
tie yourself to a specific platform. This is one of the reasons like I, I would be very wary of using like Substack instead of using my own, you know, domain and my own RSS feed and, and all that stuff, right? Like uh, ultimately open protocols like email, RSS for podcasts, you know, blogging, things like that. Google search is just treat it like another platform. We didn't realize that for a long time. Today, a lot of discovery of Free Code Camp as a community comes from Google. It, it like probably 10x what comes from social media. So uh, just just keep your eye out on, on what platforms you can leverage, but don't ever let the platform have so much control that it can determine your destiny. Just just treat everything as though it's eventually going to be bought by Elon Musk and burned to the ground. Yeah, yeah, uh, totally agree. Uh... And uh, just a quick thing I would add on to that is also don't try to build your own platform if there's an existing one with uh, that you can leverage off of. Um, right. You're going there for the audience. You're not going there for the engineering and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, open source stuff. And I think uh, with that, I'll pass it back to Logan, who is a board member of NumFocus. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't have any specific open source questions to, to ask around uh, around that. But actually, just I, I think perhaps the concluding question, because I know we're coming up on time, and this has been this has been awesome, Quincy. I think I have I have twenty more questions just <laughs> that have spawned from from the conversation that we've been having. But um, what, what's the thing that you're sort of most looking forward to in in twenty twenty three as far as um, you know, Free Code Camp and uh, the the courses that are on the horizon or um, new new sort of pivots for the for the organization. Oh, by far the most ex thing I'm most excited about are these upcoming uh, data science focused university courses that we're developing uh, because it's just like people always ask for them. And we've been publishing a lot. Like I said, we got some grants from the TensorFlow team and uh, hopefully we'll get some additional grants from different uh, players in the space um, that, are, that are creating tooling around this. Uh, but that's just like the tip of the iceberg. Like we're going to produce some really high quality, like end to end lecture series. That'll be like 15, 20 hours worth of lectures, plus labs that are probably going to be on Jupyter notebook plus exams. So it'll really feel like a high quality MOOC coming from free code game. Now, of course, if you want some high quality MOOCs, you know, uh, the Andrew Ng course has been up for quite a while. Um, there are all these other classic uh, machine learning courses that you can get and data science courses. But um, I would argue that, um, you know, it'll be nice to have one that's completely free and open that's developed by the community and that is actively maintained with interactive components. Um, so so that's, the, that's the thing I'm the most excited about probably. I love that. No, that's, uh, I'm, I'm excited about it as well. And um, I, I agree with you. It'll be really sad if uh, Twitter disappears because, or, or, you know, goes more into chaos. Cause I, I think I, that's where I consume most of my free code camp um, content. And so I'm always so excited to see a, a, an article pop up my feed. And I actually, again, uh, as another piece of praise, I, I think you all do a really nice job of figuring out like the right cadence to release stuff. So it's not overbearing and it's, uh, I'm always excited and have fresh eyes when I, when I do see that content. So um, congratulations on, on what you've built. It's, it's been uh, a tremendous uh, honor for us to have you here to, to chat about free code camp and, and hopefully um, we'll be able to have you again next year and we can hear about some updates and, and hear about uh, what uh, all the, the new lessons learned in, in 2023 that are on the horizon. Yeah, absolutely. I hope everybody watching this, I hope you enjoy the conference and I hope you learned quite a bit and I hope you're taking notes. Um, and uh, it, if I could just say parting, like call to action for everybody out there, get involved in the free cooking community. Again, we're like a charity. We're open source. We're really just like what makes free code camp great is people like you getting involved, contributing to open source. Uh, if you are bilingual and want to help us localize into uh, your ancestral tongue, we would welcome that help. Uh, and uh, just even ha hanging out on the forum and answering people's questions, just uh, anything you want to do to get involved, it's, it's a huge help. And of course, we're donor supported charity. And uh, if, if you're interested in like supporting us with like just a simple $5 a month donation, that really does go a long way. Every dollar we get from donors, dozens of hours of learning uh, are carried out thanks to each of those dollars. 
Yeah, I love that. I've been a donor on on GitHub for uh, a few months now, and it's it's awesome. I think that metric of like dollars to learner hours is so awesome, and it like it really um, it clicks for me every time I see it. I'm like, why would I not want to spend my money helping people uh, be able to learn to code? So um, definitely check it out, freecodecamp.org. It's been up on the screen for a while, and and thank you very much, Quincy, for for being here and and for sharing with us. Thank you, gentlemen. Everybody have fun. Thank, thank you. you.